Good morning. On Susan's behalf, I want to thank all of you for being here, for traveling, for being here for her, and to remember the life of our good friend George Corolla. It's a gift that you're in this place. I don't know if she shared with you, but this is the first opportunity that we have had of the last 12 months and of a pandemic to gather in this place physically under the safety measures that we have in place to be able to worship. So this is a blessing for all of us and certainly for Susan. On that note, just a few safety protocols that I want to remind us of as we worship together, as we remember together. Um, if you could please keep your mask on as we're gathered, but if you do come to the pulpit here at any point in the service to share out, you're welcome to take off your mask and you don't need to lean into this microphone where you're standing is perfectly fine. And Pastor Trent is gonna adjust the volume in accordance with your voice. If you need to use the restroom at any time through those double doors, there is a gender neutral bathroom to your immediate right and gender assigned restrooms down the hall. And we want you to be at home in this place. So at any point, if you need to use the restroom, please feel free to do that. This is our living room, so please be comfortable. And as we gather, I also want to welcome you in the spirit of God's goodness. As we remember George Corolla, let us have the space in which we can mourn and grieve. Let's carve out space in which we can celebrate and lift up joy. And let's remember that we are here to remember him, but also to support Susan in this time of grief and of celebrating. It's an exhausting and tender time, and we love you, Susan. So thanks for inviting us all to be in this space. Shall we pray? Most loving and gracious God, everlasting, ever-loving God, it's because George lived that we're gathered in this place, and we're grateful that you have granted us this opportunity to reflect on his life, to remember the gift of community and friendship, to grieve and mourn, to celebrate and uplift joy. In that paradox we gather, and we ask that your Holy Spirit will be breathed upon us, that we can simply be still, know that you are God, that George is well, and all manner of things shall be well. We pray these things knowing that you are present with us even now, and that your arms envelop our dear George. Amen. This time Maggie's going to play for us a hymn that is dear to George.
Before Susan offers a eulogy remembering George and celebrating his life, I want to share with you some readings that come from his Bible. And this has been an opportunity for me to get to know him. I have to confess that I only had the opportunity to meet George once. But in that encounter, I felt the authenticity of who he was, who he is, that being one of hospitality and kindness and charity and goodness. But in reading this Bible and the notes that he took in here and the things that he underlined and highlighted, I feel like I'm really getting to know George. This is the Bible that Susan gave him for his birthday. And he must have either had a surgeon's hands or he used a ruler to underline everything that he underlined in here because they're all straight as an arrow. Um, and he had to have read the whole thing because I don't know if you've read the Bible cover to cover, but he underlined passages from Deuteronomy, from First and Second Chronicles, from Job, not the easiest books of the Bible to read. So he, of course, read this whole thing. And he was very fond of the Proverbs, highlighted a whole lot of those. The common theme in many of the Proverbs that he underlined being about how gossip and lies lead to destruction and how wisdom is derived from humility. But one that he highlighted that stood out among the rest is Proverbs 23, verses 4 to 5. <clears throat> Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, and they're gone. They will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Like an eagle. So a few of the passages that I want to share with you and the notes that he wrote in the margins. And trust me, these are brief, but they give you an idea of our friend. From Deuteronomy, he underlined these passages. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. Do not test the Lord. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. And to the side he wrote, Love, obey God. Do not rebuke God. God is love, swift justice. In Second Chronicles, he underlined, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God. And in the margins he simply wrote, pride equals unfaithful. From the book of Job, he underlined this passage. I thought age should speak, advanced in years should teach wisdom, but it is the spirit in a man, the breath of the Almighty, that gives him understanding. And to the side, George wrote, God's spirit equals wisdom. He underlined many of the Psalms, but I only want to share a couple of them with you. This one from Psalm 34, whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. And from Psalm 41, he simply underlined two words. First, the passage. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. He underlined everlasting and everlasting. And he wrote, the Lord is always there, even if, quote, they aren't. He is always in our heart, no matter what. Always in our body. This one I wanted to share with you simply because I thought it was funny, because he underlined a whole lot in the book of Ecclesiastes. He really appreciated the notes about how vanity is worthless and all these things that are a waste of time. But in the very first chapter, he underlined this from Ecclesiastes 1.11. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come <clears throat> will not be remembered by those who follow. And off to the side, he just wrote, what? Question mark.
And then finally, just a couple of readings from the Gospels. He underlined a great deal throughout the Gospels from Jesus' teachings. The words that he wrote more than anything off to the side being love and faith, and the theme that he followed being about how greatness is derived from servanthood. But this is from Matthew 5. And Susan, I know that this will resonate with you in the words that we sing after the benediction so often here at Friends Church. Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And to the side he wrote in all caps, we must shine. And then also from the Gospel of Luke, he underlined after a lesson about pursuing goods leading to destruction. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. And off to the side, George simply wrote, God, not goods. If that's not a sermon title, I don't know what is. But the last thing that I want to share is something that he underlined from the Proverbs. He highlighted this, actually, from Proverbs 30. Two things I ask of you, O Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. God's blessings of our hearing of this living word as witness to the life of George Carolla. Thank you, Dan. And I wanted to thank everybody here. Um, and I thank the people that wish they could be here, that are here virtually with us. I, I know that if times had been different, this church would have been absolutely full of people supporting me. And I have really felt the love and the support that all of you have given me, plus the people that aren't here. Um, It has helped more than I could ever tell you. Um, This intimate atmosphere actually is something George would very much appreciate because he hated crowds. He he was not social at all. Um, We only had about 25 people at our wedding even, so this would be his cup of tea. And it's kind of like going full circle. Um, I mean, most of you in this room know the last five plus years for me have been very, very tough. And in some ways, you know, I've felt like I've been a widow for quite some time um, because the George that I knew and loved, his mind was gone and his heart was gone and there were a few glimmers the body kept on living. And that transition period um, has been been really tough. Um, Some of you have helped me with things. I mean, Chuck, Maggie, you talked to me a lot about the whole death of a spouse journey. Um, Maggie, your words to me about the guilt, you knew right away that I was feeling guilt and you know your counseling has been awesome so thank you very much my friend bob who's with us virtually lost his first wife to dementia and his words to me are something i've grabbed hold of he said susan it's hate the disease be angry at the disease don't hate the person don't be angry at the person and that's one of those things where it's it's really helped because dementia is horrible it's to see the body there and not have the person there anymore is 
is really tough. The anger that he would feel, you know, it was hard for me not to think it was directed at me, but I know it wasn't. I know it was at the circumstances. So I'm choosing right now to talk about the George of the first 25 years of our marriage and to remember the good and to share some of the stories and some of the things that you know, we did in our marriage and our life together. Um, we actually met at work in 1980, and he came across as this very gruff, intimidating man, and then found out he's actually just pretty shy, unless you were talking about insurance. And, you know, we, we would have these in-depth conversations about insurance, and we actually both loved our profession. Um, you know, if, if his mind had been there and we were, and we were still talking about it, we'd be debating this um, Chubb-Hartford merger and talking about, you know, is it going to work and what's the impact going to be? I mean, that's the kind of, you know, fun conversations we'd have. He was awkward and social, situations, but you could put him in a crowd of hundreds of people and he could give a speech about insurance. He was an excellent, excellent trainer. And so that was something that he really would open up about. And then I saw him around his dogs. And I saw a totally different person around his dogs. And I was going, okay, he's a softy. He is a, you know, a teddy bear behind that gr gruff persona. And he could open up around dogs like he could never do around people. Um, in spite of being married to him for 33 plus years, I know very little about his childhood. Um, all he would ever say to me was it was very unhappy. His parents fought all the time and um, I'm his family now. And that's kind of the way he would put it. He went to high school and grew up in Tacoma, Washington, went to Stadium High School. He got his bachelor's and his master's degree from Western Washington University in political science. And yet, to the best of my knowledge, he never voted, ever. And I, and I would always ask him, and it was one of those things he couldn't talk about because it was hard for him to open up. Um, so I have no clue why. Um, we got married in 1987, and I really felt like I was lucky enough to be married to my best friend. And we did so many hobbies together. Uh, he, one of the things I loved most is he accepted me the way I am. And he really treated me as a true partner in life. Um, that was the thing that to me was hardest about the last five years is I had to go from being his partner to being a caregiver, almost a caretaker. And that transition was tough for me. Um, so in spite of the fact that he was an introvert, and I'm not exactly an introvert, he really respected my skills and abilities. He was proud of me. He was supportive of me. Um, my family has a running family joke. They call me the tour director. And I know for people at church where you don't find that un unusual with my you know, checklists and things like that, but um, George could deal with it. And every now and then he would say, you're getting ready to be assertive and, and talk to that person or handle that situation, aren't you? And I'd say, yes. And he goes, okay, I'm leaving right now. <laughs> Let me know when you're done and then I'll come back. Um, but, you know, most of the time he could handle my assertiveness and my outgoingness. Um, one story that warmed my heart was my friend Bob in Seattle was my boss at one time. And I had just done something wonderful at work, and I don't even remember what it was. And, and Bob was t saying to George how proud he was, and it was, this was great, I'm so lucky to have her working for me. And George said, well, I'm even luckier because she's married to me. So <laughs> He was fine that I didn't want to change my name. That didn't bother him at all. We always took turns cooking and cleaning. So there was, he was, you know, housework didn't bother him. Um, 
the cooking, you know, most people, one person cooks, the other cleans up, not at our house. Whoever cooked had to do their own cleaning because he thought I always used way too many dishes. Um, he, his house, even though he would do housework, his big love was the garden. He loved gardening. Um, he used to grow dahlias, in, mainly in Washington State, and he would cut them and give them out to people. So he'd bring them to the office and pass them out to all the women at the office, um, just share the beauty of flowers, and he would grow great vegetables. And believe it or not, he loved to mow the lawn. He thought that mowing the lawn was one of those things that was an instant gratification because you could see that accomplishment right away. And this was the side of him that most people didn't know. So he would sneak around and mow the lawns for usually elderly women in the neighborhood um, just to help them out. And, and even when we weren't dating, there was a, a big time period um, before we were married when we weren't dating, I would come home and my lawn would have been mowed, and it was George. We liked to read books, and we'd pass them back and forth to each other. We liked mysteries, um, and we'd rate them. So a scale of one to ten, with one, you know, one being horrible, don't bother, and ten being great, so we'd have this. Um, and then there were some books I would read, and I would say, oh, you wouldn't like that one. He goes, oh, is it an NBR? And that stands for No Brains Required. <laughs> and I would say, yes, it's an NBR, because I had to have my escape books, too. And we did lots of walking. Um, every year, you'll, um, we did Bloom's Day, which is 12K um, in Spokane, and we did the walking part with my family. And, in a few minutes, you're going to see a slideshow that my sister, who could be here in person, put together for me. And it has pictures of the whole family and our t-shirts after we crossed the finish line. Um, but that was you know, a really fun yearly family outing. And then there's the dogs. Um, George had a German Shepherd when we got married. And that was my first experience with German Shepherds. Uh, we, um, I fell in love with the breed. He, or, he already had loved that breed of dogs. We had maybe one week in our entire marriage where we were dogless. Um, so the, during that one week, we said to ourselves, we were always going to have multiple dogs so that we never have to be dogless again because it, that was horrible to be dogless. <laughs> um, we would take the dogs on long walks every day. We competed in dog sports with the dogs. So every week we went to dog school. And my friend Pam, that's here with me, I introduced to dog sports, so she knows what dog school is all about. And um, you will see in the slideshow when Robin put it together, she was like, it's really hard to find pictures of George without a dog in it. And I said, yes. <laughs> George hated to have his picture taken. Um, so most of the pictures, if I got a picture of him, it would be like, I'm going to take a picture of the dog, and he would happen to be there too. <laughs> um, so when he, you know, in the last couple of weeks of his life, when we knew he was dying, I, I would remind him of all the dogs that we've had, and I would list the names. I had pictures of the dogs on, right there in front of him, and even when he couldn't talk anymore, he was gazing at those dog pictures. One of the things he used to say to me is, dog is God spelled backwards. And a dog really provides the same kind of unconditional love that God provides. As Dan mentioned, you know, George had a deep faith. He read the Bible every day when he could still read. Um, he did a daily devotional, but he always wanted to do them by himself. And as a way to end, I want to share one of the things he um, would say to me that means a lot. He didn't care for organized religion much, but he would say to me, I want you to remember your, go your dogs love you. I love you, and God loves you. 
And when you pet your dogs, I want you to remember that you know, they, they really are unconditional love. Thank you again for being here with me. Maggie's going to sing a hymn for us, and I want to read the words of the last stanza before she sings it. Um, the name of the hymn is In the Bulb There is a Flower, and the words have meant a lot um, to my family, and this particular hymn has been sung at every um, family service that I've been to. In our end is our beginning, in our time affinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death a resurrection, at the last a victory, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. Thank you, Maggie. I wanted to say one thing before we open it up to share some memories of George, and that's just something simple that I just thought about right now. I'm not a big fan of ties, but I intentionally didn't wear one today, which I usually would do for a funeral. But Susan told me that after George retired, he never wore a tie again. And so I'm doing this in honor of George, and it's quite liberating. Um, at this time, we want to invite those of you who might want to share recollections of George to come up here and share out. I understand there might be a few of you who are ready to do that, so as you will, and you're comfortable doing so, come on up. Good morning. 
Um, for those, I think I've met most of you, my name is Sarah Thornton, and I'm the daughter of Nancy Thornton, who was Susan's college roommate. And I'm blessed to have known Susan for all of my life, and in the past um, five years, mostly, or, or a little bit longer since Susan and George moved to College Station, I got to know uh, George pretty well, I think. Uh, when Susan asked if I wanted to share memories of George, I didn't hesitate. I said, of course, I will. And um, you know, she had called me and asked me that question. Later in the day, I, I called my mom to let her know. And my mom, being the well-meaning worrier that she can be, she was like, oh, do you, do you know what you're going to say? Are you going to write something down? I was like, mom, look, I got this. I'm an attorney. I do this all the time. And so you know, I had some time to think about what I wanted to share. And it wasn't until the past couple of days that I was really thinking about it um, that the import of this speech really hit me. Um, this is going to be one of the most important speeches I'm going to give um, in my life. You know, being asked to celebrate the life of someone um, from the family I choose. Um, Y'all may have heard that term before. You, got, you have your traditional family, um, your blood family. And so I love my blood family too, uh, since my parents and my aunt and uncle are here. Uh, but the family you choose is really, really special. And I feel so honored and blessed to know that George and Susan chose, chose me to be part of that family. And I think everyone else knows that they chose you as well to be part of that family. So I, I just wanted to share that with you so that you, know, you feel what I feel in terms of being able to be here uh, to celebrate George's life. So as I said, I, I did want to share some memories of George. Um, and most of my memories, I think, are around three things um, that I'd like to share. His love of dogs, his love of cars, and his love of Susan. Um, so George, you know, he was difficult to get to know. He didn't talk all that much. Um, but the many times I stayed at Susan and George's house for uh, football weekends, I had plenty of time to chat with him in the morning. And um, we spent some, some good chats, sometimes poking fun at my mom because she made it too easy. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> he, he really wouldn't weigh in himself, but he'd give kind of that look like, yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, but, you know, one of the things was his love of dogs that I really remember. Uh, and we always shared gifts during the Christmas time, and so any time I'd think about, okay, what am I going to get George for Christmas? I was like, okay, well, he's already got Susan, which he loves. Can't buy him a car. It's like, it's got to be something about dogs. And so, um, like George, I also had a love of Amazon, and it's amazing what you can find on Amazon. And so I would search high and low for, okay, what are some cool gifts of German Shepherds? And I hit gold, I think, one year when I found this T-shirt. Um, that was of a German Shepherd t-shirt and it was making fun of the movie The Godfather and so on it it actually says The Dog Father and it has kind of the background from the movie on it and the outline of a German Shepherd and when he opened that gift um, you know this, this was in the past five years so he's already having some difficult times with his health um, he was so excited you know I could, I could tell he really loved it and Susan was always um, quick to tell me that, yeah, no, he always wears that shirt. Um, so I, I will hold on to that memory, and I hope you will as well, Susan. Um, so cars, that's the other memory I want to share with you. He, he had a love of cars. He liked buying new cars, as Susan will well tell you. Uh, and so a couple of years, I bought what I will call my vanity car. And um, so it was football season, and one of the games, I drove it down. And, um, you know, Susan was, uh, George wasn't getting out that much, but he definitely came out to check out my car. And I was very happy to see that I think I got uh, George's stamp of approval on my car. <laughs> and so the final thing that I remember about George um, that is about how much he loves Susan, um, I, I remember, and this is, I didn't initially witness this, but my mom told me uh, when George retired and Susan was still working long hours, she's like, you know, I, I t Susan tells me she gets home and he has a glass of wine waiting for her when she's like slaved away. And I was like, wow, that's pretty fantastic. I need a guy like that that does that for me. And um, I was like, okay, you know, I, she, she did pretty well here uh, picking him. And I got to see that firsthand when I started staying at their house because as soon as you'd arrive at the house 
you know, he'd be helping unload from the vehicle. He'd ask if you need anything. He wanted to get you something to drink. Um, in the mornings when we'd wake up before we head back home, what kind of coffee do you want? He'd get the coffee ready. He'd immediately do the dishes. He very much wanted um, to take care of the people around him. Um, but no one more than Susan did he really want to take care of. And um, that was evident uh, to me. And I think one of the reasons, Susan, it was so difficult um, as his health declined was because he didn't feel like he could take care of you like he had in y'all's partnership over the past few years. Um, but I hope um, you will take solace in knowing that now he can. He can do that from above. Um, and he's going to take care of you from now on. Good morning. Uh, for those of you I have not met, my name is Doris Cook. I'm the proudest member of the class of 77, and by that you may have guessed, I knew George through Susan. I guess I knew George 20 years or better. So you know, in 20 years, you can talk about a lot with a person. And I tried to think back on some of the big talks that George and I had. Big Bang Theory. No, we didn't cover that. The difference between men and women. No, I didn't get around to that either. Ah, how and when the Aggies are going to win a national championship. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> we, we never got to that. Um, it kind of dawned on me, it may have to some of you too, uh, George was not a particularly talkative person. I am. Um, and you know what? I discovered what yin and yang means. When I was at George and Susan's, it was perfect for both of us. George sat on the couch there. I sat on the couch here. I talked. He listened. Perfect. Absolutely perfect perfect. And that's how it went for 20 years. I didn't really give a lot of thought to whether George might have been at some point willing to say, I got it. Enough. <laughs> but he was quite a gentleman. He, he didn't ever do that. Um, I couldn't tell you what we talked about. A lot of words passed, a lot of conversation, probably a lot of nodding on George's part, if, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, but I, I think one of the reasons that probably George and I got along as, as well as we did is because I respected his animals. That was important. That was, a, that was a big deal. I could talk about whatever I wanted to, but I knew whenever the big dog got on the couch first, I took what space was left. And that is the way it is. So I don't know what George is doing today. I, I don't know, but what I hope he's doing. I'm picturing at their house a big, slobbery, probably red dog toy. And I hope George has got a hold of it. And I hope that he's playing fetch with Murphy or another one of the long list of German Shepherd dogs whose names begin with M. I hope he's playing fetch. Godspeed, George. Rest in peace. Well, I know I should have went first because uh, the prior two took all of my material. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Steve Elsesser. For y'all don't know me, uh, I'm related through uh, to George through A uh, and M football. So, uh, and didn't get the privilege of knowing him other than the last five years. Uh, so, my, uh, I'm uh, a little, uh, a lot saddened that I didn't get to know him prior, especially with the readings from the Bible that 
uh, I really wish I knew that so that we could have shared some of that. I'm not sure if he would have let me, but uh, during that time. Uh, so some of the things that I'm going to rehash are uh, some of uh, the conversations between George and I. Yes, no, uh, okay. Um, and he could string several words together. I'm doing fine. You don't need to ask again. I'm doing fine. So George is not a talkative person, as you all know. And I, like I said, didn't get a chance to know him when he was uh, not uh, at his best, I guess, how to put it. But I did want to relay one uh, memory that uh, actually both Linda and I remember. And that was one of the first times we came and had a uh, tailgate at uh, Susan and George's uh, uh, house. And my memory of him was not very talkative, so that's not a news flash to anybody, but very attentive. And you could just tell that he was here and there and wanting to do and you know do you need another beer yes of course uh, uh, so and I could see in his eyes that a he didn't particularly like this gathering of people not us particularly but meaning people other than dogs and Susan uh, but that he was doing this out of love for Susan. That you could tell, I could tell that when he looked at her uh, and when he was serving us or doing dishes, it was because he loved her that he, I don't wanna say put up with us, but <laughs> you know, he, he just showed his love through his servitude. And so that truly impressed me. And in the later times when I'd come by and see him, uh, we didn't get very far uh, because uh, it wasn't a yin and yang. It was two yings together or two yangs together, whatever it is. Uh, I'm not a talker. He's not a talker. So you can imagine how short our conversations were. Uh, but uh, I do appreciate uh, Susan letting me to share the, the little that I did know about George and his love for you. But just listening to everyone talk about George, um, the one thing that comes out is he was a servant. He enjoyed serving people and doing for people. And as we're going into the Easter season, the Passover, uh, remember when Jesus Christ took his robe off and put the towel on and washed his disciples' feet and said, this is what you need to do is to go out and serve other people. So George certainly lived his faith. Thanks be to God. Thank you for sharing that. That Maundy Thursday is probably my, easily my favorite time, favorite time in Holy Week and the Easter season, the time of Lent, but maybe even my favorite high holy day throughout the Christian calendar year because of exactly what you shared. The degree to which we serve determines the measure of our greatness. And it sounds to me like George was truly great. We've got a slideshow that we wanna share with you at this time.
so few of the pictures that we just saw were of George by himself, and so many of them surrounded by people and four-legged loves. Thank God for him seizing life and sharing it with so many. Hear these words of commendation. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, George Carolla. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a son of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the company of the saints in light. Amen. Again for being here. Now let's enjoy a time of fellowship with each other. Thank you again for traveling so far to be together today. Okay. <laughs>